So, uh, my name's Pete. Um, this is a really sort of high-level um, introductory uh, talk on retro computing. Uh, so, playing around with and uh, working with older hardware. Um, and for this talk, I'm not going to be going into like older mainframe systems, IBM, CDC stuff. Uh, and I'm also not going to really be talking about uh, early uh, home microcomputers like Altair's, Commodore, things like that. Uh, what I am going to talk about is uh, Unix machines from about the mid 70s to the early 90s. So, going from like Digital Equipment Corporation, Sun Microsystems, SGI. Uh, and the reason for that is these machines, first of all, they can run semi more modern, modern operating systems. Right? You can throw NetBSD on these things, uh, it sort of just runs everywhere. Um, and that's actually the, the reference platform for this talk uh, will be uh, NetBSD. Um, and it also has fairly good documentation. So, so why these particular machines? Well, they have historical significance, right? Um, you know, Digital Equipment Corporation uh, started off doing uh, laboratory equipment and then uh, pivoted uh, specifically to uh, doing computing for uh, laboratory and research institutions. And, uh, you know, with ARPANET, most of the machines on it by the mid 70s were some form of deck machine. There's, you know, if you look at uh, a, uh, a diagram of ARPANET, which I have uh, in a couple of slides, there's a ton of PDPs on it. And so, so that's, that's one reason. The other is uh, a lot of these systems are fairly easy to get your hands on. Um, less so, um, you know, as, as time goes on, but, you know, you can often find these being given away or, you know, uh, people that are into, into retro computing sort of have, that have a plethora of them trying to give them away to good homes. Um, and they don't require special infrastructure. You don't need special cooling or power for the most part. So these, these things are feasible to have, you know, in your house or office or dorm room or, or whatever. Um, really? Really? I should turn them off. All right, so, awesome, this is great. Hey, so right, even Vaxin. Um, the Microvax, uh, Vaxstation 2000 actually came in a lunchbox form factor. So, you know, machines that you sort of associate with uh, big iron, you can put on your desk. So right, so here's that diagram I was talking about. Um, it's sort of readable, right? Um, a lot of those machines, you see PDP-1, PDP-11, PDP-10, and uh, VAX, uh, a lot of people cut their teeth on, on VAX. Um, and, but, was there, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, so, so, so Digital Equipment Corporation, you know, they, they have the PDP-11, uh, later VAX, uh, VAX virtual address extensions, basically a 32, Envision is a 32-bit extension uh, to the VAX architecture. Um, and they also had uh, some, some machines based on the MIPS ar architecture. Uh, those were uh, Aldrich and OSF1 were the operating systems that sort of shipped with those. And then later on, uh, the alphas. And uh, for the most part, with the exception of the 16-bit the PDP-11, uh, they'll, all, they'll all run a modern version of NetBSD. So you can get these up and running uh, and play around with them and you know, use them. And that's sort of the point. Uh, SGI, another fairly well-known company. Um, more so for the, the graphics capability at the time, right? These were the machines that supported, you know, video streaming um, and, uh, and and 3D rendering back when, you know, most people were still using text terminals. Um, and there's also a range of architectures. Right? Most of them are MIPS. Uh, they had some x86 machines, but those, you know, they're not particularly interesting, so we're going to talk about this. Um, and, of course, Sun Microsystems, right? Uh, they started off with M68K. It was the Sun 1. Uh, and then Spark, uh, still around uh, in the 64-bit variety, but there was also a 32-bit version. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Debian discontinued support for Spark 32 and Lenny, uh, so, uh, well, that's okay. Um, but the NetBSD still has a 32-bit version that will work. Um, and of course, Next. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Next towards the, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, that, that's some, some interesting history, right? I mean, Next Station, the first web server was, was an, a Next Station machine. Um, they, they really pioneered um, the 
sort of what we envision is modern object oriented user environments, right? Objective C comes from the next operating system. If you've ever done like iOS programming uh, you'll, or uh, uh, programming for, for Mac OS, a lot of the, the libraries start with NS dot, which is next step. That's the operating system that, you know, uh, Steve Jobs brought back with him that influenced a lot of uh, OS 10, mock kernel also. Uh, so, right getting these things, right? You can find them on eBay. Um, <clears throat> I did some searching uh, a couple of days ago, and some machines are pretty cheap. You can get like a Spark IPC for like 25 bucks. Some of them are surprisingly expensive, um, uh, mostly due to the fact that a lot of these machines are still in use by some companies like, oh, I don't know, banks and travel agencies. And so they actually use these for, you know, revenue generating things. Uh, so finding hardware and, and replacement for those as they age becomes more and more difficult. So working components are actually really expensive because they're enterprise priced now. Um, so a, a good way to, to, to get machines in, and actually the, the way that I got most of my hardware uh, was from basically like universities throwing them out. Um, so, you know, if you, if you happen to come across an old machine and you're interested in older hardware, rescue it, give it a good home, play around with it. So, uh, and uh, one thing to, to keep in mind, if you're, if you're just getting started, my, my sort of personal recommendation is find something, work backwards. Start with, with newer hardware uh, and, and go backwards from there. Um, the, like, machines like Alphas are, are pretty forgiving uh, and, and surprisingly easy to work with. Um, they're, you know, the, the boot prom is uh, user friendly uh, in comparison to some other systems. So, so how do you talk to these things? Well, you know, the obvious thing is, well, there's Serial Console, right? Everything speaks Serial. Um, it's a good interface. Using machines like this as a workstation can be difficult if you don't get all of the hardware together, right? Most of these things, now well, they're not quite VGA. Maybe they're not quite uh, any sort of now standard video signal. They may just be, you know, BNC feeds for red, green, and blue, or monochrome. Uh, finding peripherals, keyboards, and mice can be challenging. Uh, so it, the easiest thing to do is, you know, you can, you can get a PL2303 serial adapter, USB. Um, it runs on everything. Uh, there's drivers for Linux, Windows, OS X. Um, and, and that's really the best way to get started. You don't need to, to worry about uh, monitors and Basically, you're, you're reducing the number of failure-prone components. Um, so another option, of course, if you want a really traditional experience, is to get a serial terminal. Um, uh, you know, a, a VT100, ADM 3As, ADM 5s are you know sort of a uh, a fun way to get a very authentic experience. Uh, but again, uh, it, it introduces an additional maintenance component. So, right, um, hard drives, <laughs> they fail, right? Uh, when your hard drive is 25 years old, it will definitely fail. Uh, you really should make use wherever possible of uh, netbooting. And it's a bit more work, right? There's, there's more setup involved, there's more things you need to be aware of, uh, but sort of worth it in the long run because, well, You'll be able to, you know, share environments across machines. If you have a couple of identical machines, they can share uh, most of the file system and, you know, shared home directories and, and goodness like that. And also, you can, you know, offload all of the storage onto newer hardware um, that is, if it fails, at least it's replaceable. Uh, so, right, you'll get some experience with older networking technology uh, if you decide to... Uh, play around with these things. You'll get very familiar with 10Base2 and ThinNet, uh, and you'll experience the joy of transferring a kernel image over ThinNet. Uh, I suggest that you start the boot process, go get lunch, and come back a little bit later, because it can take some time. Um, you can find uh, AUI uh, uh, twisted pair transceivers for like five bucks. Pretty easy to come by. Um, a lot of machines of this vintage uh, usually have, if they, if they have an integrated network card, uh, will have an AUI interface. So if, you know, the, the other option is, you know, we'll have an AUI interface in ThinNet. Well, if you don't want ThinNet, you can pop a transceiver on it. Really? Um, and then, you know, you're good to go. So, right. 
to bring up a system, obviously you need an operating system on useful media. So you have a couple of options. Uh, tape, that's always fun. Or floppy disks, that's extra fun. Or uh, if you're lucky enough, uh, so, so newer machines like uh, Alphas and, and the Spark 64s, you know, they have PCI buses. You can put, I, I have a SATA card in one of my Alpha machines because it works. You can do that. So you can actually get uh, CD-ROM drives in some of them. Uh, there was also SCSI CD-ROMs, although um, there's some weirdness that you have to be aware of. Uh, they're not all identical. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a variety of different types of, uh, of SCSI, uh, and they're not all uh, cross-compatible, as well as there's some proprietary, uh, like uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, their, their CD-ROM drives uh, will not work in some microsystems machines for the most part. Um, just something to be aware of. So, right, netbooting, probably the best way to go. Um, right. So what do you need to netboot? Well, if, you, if you're running a VAX, right, VAX, uh, there's a management protocol, MOP, uh, that's pretty, it's a digital equipment corporation specific. And uh, there's MOPD on NetBSD, so basically you give it a kernel image to load, and it goes ahead and does it. It, it basically co uh, combines uh, reverse address resolution as well as a TFTP in sort of one package. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll need some way for the machine to get an IP address. Usually this is done with RARP or BootP. Um, and DHCPD, or um, DNS mask, I'm sorry, uh, is actually a, a really useful uh, utility. It, it combines a dynamic DNS server, uh, DHCP server, boot P, and TFTP in one nice package. So if you, if you want sort of a one-stop shop for that stuff, that's, uh, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, and it's available on, on Linux as well as NetBSD. And obviously you need NFS to provide the file system. So there's some conventions, um, and uh, one of the reasons that I, I like using NetBSD for uh, these systems is they have really good documentation uh, when it comes to the specifics that some machines require, right? So, so Vaxin uh, with MOP will look for a file, the MAC address of the system .sys, and that's what it will boot for. Uh, Sun machines, uh, specifically uh, the Spark 32-bit machines, actually look for a uh, file name of the MAC address, or the IP address in hex, dot whatever the architecture is, so like Sun4C, Sun4M. Um, and newer machines, the, the Spark 64s and Alphas, you can actually specify the boot file uh, in the, the prom, uh, which makes you know, that much more simpler, which is another reason why um, I recommend starting newer and, and working back. Um, huh, one thing to uh, also keep in mind is embrace plain text, right? These machines uh, are often not just not computationally fast enough to make SSH useful. Uh, I suggest creating a basically a separate plain text network that you put these machines on, uh, and that way you can use things like Telnet um, and um, you know our login and not have to worry too much uh, about you know what's going on. Uh, if you really, really, really don't want to send passwords in clear text over the wire, you can use Kerberize Telnet, uh, and then you at least you know have uh, your your login part protected, and the rest of the traffic obviously is still in the clear. Um, and also, you know, if you're one of those people that worries about Tempest emissions, huh, yeah, these machines generate quite a bit of EMF noise. Uh, so, so this is an example uh, setup of uh, uh, some stuff that I have in my basement. All right, so, you know, there's uh, the rest of the network, right? And I have a, you know, x86 um, NetBSD box that has, you know, all of the right things that you need to boot a machine. So you have uh, NFS and a boot P server and DATP server, et cetera, and a ThinNet card, uh, which powers uh, most of the hardware, uh, as well as a serial console server, um, which is useful um, because then, you know, you don't have to walk around with a serial cable and plug in each one. You can just tell that into the thing and then you get console. Um, so, right. Why bother? Why, why even, you know, deal with old hardware, right? So, sure, there's, you know, a cliche in the industry, right, that everything's obsolete on launch, right? And obviously that's BS, but it's interesting to see what you can do with limited resources, right? And, and that's sort of um, relevant today, right? Because you have things like Internet of Things and embedded devices, and those are becoming more and more common. And yes, you know, you can get, you know, like my phone, which is tiny, has a tremendous amount of computing power, but 
you know, when you, when you work with things like, you know, SCADA and microcontrollers, obviously you have fewer resources and sort of the, the nifty tricks that engineers did 20 years ago to get the most out of this hardware, that's an interesting perspective to have. Uh, you may approach things a little bit differently um, having had experience working with slower systems. You're more aware of, you know, how long some operations take to run and more mindful of, you know, what uh, limited resources, um, you know, what those constraints are. And, you know, also you sort of get a, a little bit of a deeper connection to the hardware, you know, sort of the same way that, you know, people like classic cars, basically, you know, the geek equivalent, right? Um, so, the, and there's also some, some nifty little historical footnotes, right? Um, so the ADM terminal, right, uh, was one of uh, the terminals that was used a lot in the development of Unix. Uh, and the home key and the tilde key on the ADM terminal uh, are the same key, which is where the shortcut for home in Linux and Unix systems come from. Uh, also, the arrow keys on that machine were on HJKL, which is where navigation and things like them come from. Um, and I talked to, about earlier about uh, next step, right? Um, the mock kernel, uh, the NS prefix. Also, um, the the funk sound in OS 10 is the same one that was in next step. They even carried over a lot of the media. Um, and you know, VMS. Uh, in the 80s, supported things that are still sort of hard problems now, right? Um, VAX clustering through DECnet allowed, you know, a dynamic reallocation of processes in the cluster. You can do rolling reboots and rolling upgrades. And they had, you know, systems with 16-year cluster uptime because they could just, you know, upgrade the machine as they went. Um, and, and these are still things that are sort of challenging in IT environments now. What they say, the joke is nothing is ever new in computing, um, you know, Cloud computing and web applications are basically time-sharing 2.0. Uh, so, right, thank you for showing up so early. Um, my contact info, you can find me at freedma.org or at pfriedma. Um, those uh, resources I listed are really fantastic, especially the uh, uh, Manx is basically a collection of PDF scan manuals for a whole bunch of machines. If you need a maintenance manual for a PDP-1, they've got it. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned, the documentation on NetBSD is really fantastic. Um, so, just any questions? Comments? You should have turned off Xlog. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>